Oh my word. Grasshoppers. The spies. The ones that had the wrong report saw themselves as grasshoppers compared to the giants. David killed a, a bear, killed a lion in preparation for the giant. He knew he could take the giant because he had already battled the lion and the bear. And then he said, giants will become our bread. So giant, we will eat giants. Now, this lights me up, Annalise, because I hate the liar and I hate lies and I hate that lies literally keep people stuck in an emotional and mental torment. These lies are like giants. But in Christ, Jesus came to destroy the lies, to destroy the works of the liar. And now we're called to destroy with the truth the works of the liar. But he makes our giants bread. So, so like the very thing that I used to hate about myself now becomes bread. <laughs> or the very lie that I've always believed or the very thing that I've been had most anxiety about now becomes bread. And so the grasshoppers are how they saw themselves compared to the giants. They had the wrong report, even though factually it was probably true. But Joshua and Caleb, they saw the fruit and they said that we can we can take these giants like this is nothing. They had a perspective of life that was true, but maybe not factual. Factual meaning like, yeah, it probably was true, like they were a lot smaller than the giants. But they had a God perspective that was higher than facts. <laughs> And so grasshoppers to me is like wrong self-image or wrong way of thinking. It's wrong thinking or it's the natural mind. It's the natural mind. And so now here comes John. He's eating grasshoppers and what and honey. So like he was already in the promised land eating giants like these giants of self um I don't know, like that just really, really lights me up that God will make giants in the land our bread. And it hit me when we were taking communion at church. We were like, here's eat the bread. Let's partake of the bread. And I was like, oh my gosh, bread. This is like giants that are being made bread right now as we're eating and eating his flesh and eating his blood were like taking down the giants.
grace and mercy, the two characteristics of God that dominates the word. Moses asked to see God's glory and he said, my goodness will pass by. And he saw the working of God in time, which is just good. But man cannot understand because this is a realm of darkness. And then he said, I will be gracious on whom I will be gracious. And I will be merciful on whom I will be merciful. Grace is when you get what you don't deserve. Mercy is when you don't get what you do deserve. Mercy is the forgiveness of sins and the redemption of the soul. And the whole of the Old Testament was a preparing for this place where the judgment was taken by none other than God himself to bring you into grace and truth, which is mercy. David had this revelation of mercy. He said, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. It was not the house of Moses. The house of Moses had to be broken down. He said, though I go through a shadow of death, the shadow of death is what we have before the cross. In Christ, when you die, he says, blessed are you for your rest from your labor and your work follow you. Everything changed in him. God never forsook creation and he never will. The word explains the word, not our natural carnal minds. The carnal mind cannot understand the things of God because they are spiritually discerned. So we literally have to speak the spirit language, which is colors, numbers, symbols, and patterns. And these patterns are generations, wheels within wheels, generational cycles in life cycles unto the purposes of God. For we are called according to his purpose, not our imagination. It's time that we understand the purposes of God in the word. The end is always set from the beginning and every generation, the end is set from the beginning and the best is always kept for last. It's time we understand that the things we have not seen, we have not heard, is about to break open. Yes, but what about the world? No, but what about the purposes of God? The night Jesus was betrayed, he took a cup and he said, this is the New Testament in my blood. The very next morning, he stepped over the river Kidron and he entered the garden and all of a sudden he started sweating and his sweat became blood. And he said, let this cup pass from me. But Hebrews tells us that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. When he, when he served the cup, he was not sweating, yet in the garden it was agony. Was this the same cup as the night before? No. Just before that, he was sitting over Jerusalem and he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, what more could I have done for you? And he actually cried. Now, if we take the cup and the patterns of the cup right back, we will see that the night Babylon was destroyed. The king of Babylon, which means the god of this world, they were drinking from the cups that came from the temple. And that very night, while they were drinking, there was a writing on the wall that said, you were weighed and you found to light. That night, Babylon was invaded and taken over. Babylon was deserted. It was never burned. But in Revelation, we read about mystical Babylon, the people that pushed God to touch the cup. And this happened in the garden. And he said, let this cup pass from me. And he saw the destruction that was going to come on Jerusalem, who became an abomination that killed the Christ. The minute they killed the Christ, he had to take the cup and the destruction on them. Because in Revelation 17, the whore, mystic Babylon, riding the beast, Rome, and in her hand was a golden cup with all the blood of the martyrs. And Revelation is the revenge of the blood of the prophets that Matthew 23 spoke about. So this is definitely not the cup for us. 
looking at the principle of first mentioning, we have to go to the first place where we read about the cup. <laughs> when the twelve brothers went to get grain. On returning, the king's cup was found in Benjamin's bag. The son of my sorrows have become the son of my right hand. Benjamin's cup is ours. There's going to come a time of reward where our money will be restored and our food will be totally restored. Jesus took the cup of destruction so that we can have the New Testament, the cup in his blood. He paid the price so we can live. The Euphrates is trying, says Revelation, and we have to go back to the principle of first mentioned in the garden. There were four rivers. Two we know, two is unknown because there was agreement of heaven and earth. But the two that agreed on earth was the Tigris and the Euphrates, which formed the land of Shinar, the place where the garden manifested. After the flood, they tried to rebuild this God and said, we'll do it our way. God immediately stopped man because man's ways were now darkened. And he says, no, I'll do it my way. And nations were birthed. And from there, they battled it out till it became the greatest nation ever on the face of the earth, Babylon. But right after Babel, God called Abram out of that area and he said, I want you to move. And he moved from the Ur of the Chaldees right up to Haran. And there God said, now you move away from your family. I'm going to make you a new generation. Haran means mountaineer. And Abraham had to move down to the promised land. God gave him a promise and said, every place that your foot will be, I will give you. From the Euphrates right up to Egypt. The Euphrates now formed the western border between the old garden and the new promised land. Egypt was not part of the promised land. And every time these people had famine, they ran down to Egypt and there they lied about their bride. And the Bible is all about the bride because the end he says the spirit and the bride says, come. God's people never entered the rest and they never took their promised land <laughs> Before they even started, they said, we are grasshoppers and we cannot take it. But in spite of them and that generation that had to be destroyed in the desert, for a new generation to stand up, God took them to their promised land. But they made the promised land a wilderness. Babylon came in and conquered the nation and they had to go all the way back that Abraham came. They were captive for 70 years. A complete time that God was working with him. In the city of Babylon, which was built on the Euphrates that bordered the old manifested garden and the new promised land, which they never possessed. Babylon marking now the beginning of their end. The night the king of Babylon touched the cup of God that came from the temple, there was a handwriting on the wall and he said, you are weighed and found to light. That night, Babylon was taken over and Babylon was destroyed. Setting the pattern of the mystical Babylon, God giving his people another 70 times 70 years. So Babylon marked the beginning of their end. 70 times 7 years were given unto them, but they killed the prophets and instead of receiving the Christ, they now killed the Christ and became mystical Babylon. And the night they forced Christ to touch the cup. Spiritually, the Euphrates is drying up again. And this is what we have in the book of Revelation. It's a spiritual book. The Euphrates drying up, meaning is no more promised land, no more old manifest garden, but the glory of God is going to fill the earth. When they said, we are as grasshoppers, God said, as sure as I live, my glory shall fill the earth. All the rivers are drying up now as well as the Euphrates. And the Euphrates drying up is fulfilling the patterns that it's time for the glory of God to fill the earth. Wow, what a great time to live in. Though the world grows darker and darker, 
What the eye have not seen and the ear have not heard is waiting for the children of God. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman rightly dividing the word of truth. How do we divide the word? We cannot divide the living word. We have to divide the written word. The written word is stories laid down in time. Holy men spoke and it was written down as the Holy Spirit moved them. This word was also combined by the Holy Spirit that called people together and they sorted out the right text to be in the word. These stories were written down in certain time periods because Ecclesiastes tells us that for everything there is a season. There is a purpose for every time. In Genesis 1 we find the pattern of time. There were set two lights that would make a division between day and night and they'll be for time, seasons and years and signs. The pattern of time was set and we have to understand and discern the times. Not understanding times will leave you lost in the corridors of time, never knowing where you are going. In the fullness of time, God came right on time to save man from himself. But he brought this light right into darkness. And we are still set in the time of darkness. The same time light came, a gross darkness came upon the face of the earth. But in 1 John 2, we read that the darkness is now over and the day star must rise in our heart. This is the time of the kingdom, a growing into the spirit right here in the realm of darkness back to where we'll be in the image and likeness of God once more. Because man lost the likeness and just kept the image and God came in the image putting the likeness right inside of our hearts when his image became the final sacrifice, the body on the cross, so we can carry the spirits in our hearts. The time of gross darkness was the birth of the church and the removal of the old, the same time. But in Revelation, he says, it is done. And now the kingdom is finally open because the Holy Spirit signified that the new could not function while the old was still recognized. The kingdom is not just a place of revelation. It's now stepped over into a manifestation of the revelations, which was given to Paul during the time of gross darkness, which actually became the foundation stones of the new Jerusalem. And now the call is waiting. Who will come up into this mountain of God? Christ in us is the hope of glory. But the biggest words ever from humanity is to be in him. He went to prepare us a place that we can be where he is. That is the high mountain. Christ is our place. He is our high mountain. But we have to get out of ourselves to step into him. Not understanding times in the Bible will leave you lost in the corridors of time, always fearing what is coming. But when you know where you come from and know where you're going and understand the purposes of God found in the volume of the book, not in separate stories, you step into a place where God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love and a sound mind. God is, always will be the ultimate winner. Satan does not have the last say. He was already defeated on the cross. The husband now patiently waits for us to understand that our high priests are seated in heaven and all principalities, powers and wickedness in high places is under his feet. And until we realize it, he will wait patiently for us. The time is here to stand up and know our warfare is not flesh and blood. We cannot fight darkness with darkness. Light drives darkness out. It's not what you do. It's what you are. I have not seen and ears have not heard what God has in store for man. The best is yet to come while we are even in this world of darkness. And he said, unless he dies, it cannot be quickened on the cross. Christ was totally in control, though it seemed like the darkest day ever. 
He has never lost that control. And it doesn't matter what happens. We need to understand his purpose and not be moved by what is happening in the world.